2015 webinar series. Uh, we'll have one more webinar to do the final report out. But today, for the agenda, we're going to do um, an eyesight sharing, review the integrating biology into design process, present information about life's principles, how to evaluate your design using life's principles, using a systems approach, an update on the in-person session, and the team homework for the in-person session, uh, present some phone meeting options, and a September report out webinar questions and comments. So let's get started. So when was the last time you thought, will I survive today? One of the benefits of our human cleverness is that we rarely think about our own survival, something on the mind of every other organism on this planet, except maybe for some domesticated animals. When you're out in nature, notice how this mindset shapes the actions of other organisms in the natural world. And think about what would you do differently today if you had this constraint? Does anybody on the line want to um, share one of their eyesight experiences today? Just raise your hand. <coughs> All right. Well, continue with your eyesight. It'll help you reconnect to the natural world. So let's review quickly the integrating biology into design. And so um, in the creating phase, which is where we come up with the solution, before we get there, we need to biologize the question, which we've done um, by identifying the function, discover natural models by looking outside, asking nature or asking Sheridan to help you discover these. We've abstract the design principles translating the biological mechanisms that you've discovered into a design principle, emulate the best models, and then don't forget to thank nature. Your homework for last month was to practice abstracting the biological mechanism from scientific literature, ask nature, and personal observation for your team's design challenge. Someone online, could you mute? mute? Thank you. Abstracting is one of the most critical components of practicing biomimicry and also one of the most difficult. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this process? Just raise your hand. I don't see any at this time. OK. So the creating is an exercise in pursuing the creative design solution for your challenge. It's creating something new, putting new things together in new ways, and making and inventing. The ideation phase of creating is the most fun and traditionally involves a combination of incorporating research results on how others have solved for that opportunity or challenge oh, opportunity and brainstorming new oh, solutions. Someone just joined. Could you mute your line, please? Every discipline that needs and generates solutions ultimately has some sort of creating phase in their process, and biomimicry dovetails really easily into this phase. By asking one more question, how does nature solve this, the idea pool of the creating stage can be enhanced with a suite of novel strategies for the issues at hand. We can incorporate ideas from abstracted biological strategies and design concepts from life's principles. You'll have an opportunity to work with your team during the in-person session to use the abstracted design principles discovered in nature to create a solution to your environmental challenge. Karen Allen and Jamie Dwyer, both biomimicry professionals, along with Diana and myself, will assist your team with this step. So let's look at life's principles. What are life's principles? Life on Earth is made up of an ever-changing, increasingly complex network of interconnected, interdependent organisms. Some forms of life have managed to sustain itself on Earth for the past 3.8 billion years through ice ages, tsunamis, volcanoes, and asteroids. This means that life has survived 3.8 billion years of testing and 3.8 billion years of rigorous selection that has resulted in a 99.9% .9 failure rate. Only one-tenth of 1% of species that have ever lived on Earth today survive. 
In other words, the species surviving today are the success stories. In trying to identify and emulate the strategies these successful creatures share, life's principles provide us with an important tool for strategic design. Life's principles are what biomimics use to both draw, dive and eval evaluate the sustainability and appropriateness of our designs. Scientists have been working for centuries trying to identify how nature works to unlock the secrets of survival and to unravel life's mysteries. With so many scientific papers being published, it may seem that every organism has a unique way of surviving and even thriving in its niche of the environment. Upon closer consideration, though, patterns emerge. Many creatures have similarities. They may have a comparable shape or move liquid using the same mechanism or have a similar response to danger or employ the same chemical reaction. In biomimicry, these patterns are called deep principles. For example, not every organism employs capillary action, which is using the physical property of surface tension to control the movement of water. But plants and a few animals do move liquid in this manner. Because of its frequent appearance in nature, capillary action is considered a deep principle. Some principles, such as being locally attuned in responses, are even more common across species than the deep principles that are found uniformly across almost all organisms. The Biomimicry Guild and the Biomimicry Institute, along with many partners, have studied, compiled, and distilled scientific research to create a collection of these more fundamental principles now known as biomimicry's life principles. Life principles are intended to represent nature's strategy for sustainability, that is, how life has sustained on Earth for 3.8 billion years. The three seeds of biomimicry represent the foundation of the biomimicry mean. Life principles are a part of each seed. This overlap occurs because life principles do, not play, do indeed play a vital role in the foundation of each seed. For someone new to biomimicry, life principles can be a link or an entry point into a seed they have not yet explored. For those working in different realms, the set of life principles is a tool for integrating the genius of nature into your work. Life principles provide a high standard, distilled from other creatures' successes, to help redefine and guide our choices as we strive to fit in here on Earth. Life's principles are the basis for the mindset shift that must happen in order for sustainability to become integrated into our ethos. In our reconnect with nature, life's principles provide a bridge to biology. It's like a biology 101 in shorthand. These principles are the summary of things scientists have recognized in nature, and they are principles a biomimic can witness and develop as you explore nature. While observing these principles, biomimics can experience the interconnectedness of the natural world, humans included. As people become reconnected to nature, it becomes more instructional to see ourselves as part of being part of the Earth system, not independent from it. In emulation, life's principles provide a tool from, for the different aspects of the biomimicry process. Life's principles can provide a visioning tool and help guide a project's priority. During design, life's principles can be inspirational and provide a framework for choosing among design options. After a design is complete, life's principles can be the basis for continuing assessment on how the final outcome of the product performs. So in shorthand, life's principles represent a tool developed by Biomimicry 3.8 to help us understand the high levels of patterns in how life has evolved to thrive and survive. They can be the underlying ethos and aspirational goals for the scoping and visioning for a project, as well as provide a tangible list with, each, it, with which to evaluate a design. 
Given that life's principles are embedded in so many aspects of implementing biomimicry, we need to develop a deep understanding of what each principle means and start to recognize these principles in nature. So life's principles are presented here as a one-page diagram with a set of definitions on the back. And you can download this PDF from Google if you just Google biomimicry life's principles. This diagram is designed so that the one page may stand alone, an extremely difficult task and is rather daunting to sum up the, in one two-dimensional representations, the strategies of 30 million species, how they evolved over 3.8 billion years. The diagram contains several elements and it is structured with specific intentions. This webinar will go into the details of life's principles. In this diagram, you will find the title or caption, small circle in the upper left, which puts forth what life's principles are. It is meant to complement the circularity of the principles themselves, reminding us that we must look at these as a whole set, and the absence of one creates an incomplete picture. The suite of principles is a result of and subject to the operating conditions of the planet found in the blue arrow and the lower left side of the circle. Life's operating conditions remind us what is driving these adaptations. The center of the circle is both the aspirational goal and the emerging properties of these principles, creating conditions conducive to life. The principles are clustered both in similarity, similarity and in relatedness, as well as with a degree of hierarchy. It is reasonable to ask the question, how does life achieve that principle and find the answers in the principles that lie between the main principle and the center of the circle? Just as no principle stands alone, all principles are interconnected and the case can be made for rearrangement of the sub-principles and master principles. Use the tool and the diagram as it suits you Yet keep in mind that it is the integration and optimization of the collective and collaborative suite of principles, the whole system, that yields life its success. Biomimicry believes it will do the same for humans too. So life's principles show us how nature is our mentor. The principles provide aspirational ideals. Fitting in on life is, fitting in on earth is more than just our own survival. Humans are also part of a larger system and can contribute to the health of, earth, of the earth. Life's principles show us how a seemingly isolated design is in fact linked to a larger and larger system and ultimately part of the largest system planet Earth. Life on Earth is interdependent. Life's principles illustrate how all organisms and all species link as one interconnected system. Life's principles are also sustainable benchmarks. Are our designs accomplishing this principle? This is nature as oh. measure. This is nature as oh. measure. This is nature as measure. Oh. Can someone mute the Thank you. This, this is nature as measure. If these principles are used as the overreaching pattern held in common by the surviving species on Earth, if designers purposely set out to fulfill these principles, our designs would likely fit in on Earth and facilitate our survival over the long haul. To fit in on Earth, humans can strive to live and design in alignment with life's principles and measure our designs against them. Life integrates these principles in an optimal configuration to create conditions conducive to life. The phrase, life can, creates conditions conducive to life, is at the center of the life's principle circle. This concept is the goal and the reason for using life principles as a tool. But what is life, and how does a designer create conditions to support life? An explicit definition of life is hard to find. Some definitions give list of requirements like growth, metabolism, adaptation, reproduction, while others designate minimum, 
requirements like re responding to stimuli inside and outside themselves or being part of a whole network of systems. Humans, ironically, tend to readily accept the first type of definition while tending to avoid the latter. We spend so much effort trying to overcome our surroundings rather than responding to them and consistently work to e extract ourselves from the natural systems around us. Of course, in reality, we fit in all of these definitions and therefore it behooves us to work towards creating conditions conducive to life both to ourselves and to other living entities. Creating conditions conducive to life becomes a non-negotiable precept for developing any ethically and environmentally sound designs. So the foundation and need for the mindset shift to life's principles is really based on Earth's operating conditions. And we have reviewed these in the first webinar, but let's just look at them a second time. Earth's operating conditions are non-negotiable characteristics of the planet. Life strategies have evolved to function well in the same context that human designs must, the context of the Earth. Life survives by working within and even leveraging the surrounding context in which the strategy must operate, including the context of the planet. Of course, humans live here on Earth and our designs must function within that context. Of the many properties of Earth, some universal conditions have particularly large influences on Earth's occupancy. In other words, it has a big impact on life. And we refer to these as life's op Earth's operating conditions. So let's review them real quickly. So everything on the planet is subject directly or indirectly to sunlight. All the energy for all the organisms come from sunlight. We're, we're subject directly or indirectly to water, where all chemistry is done in water, and to gravity. All organisms on the planet either use gravity to stay stuck on the planet or have developed strategies to overcome gravity, like bird flight. Conditions on Earth are constantly changing, and this means that they are dynamic. So life is subject to dynamic non-equilibrium. This means that things are always changing, as we have seen over the next last few years, how the weather patterns are changing. Organisms that can adapt and evolve to these changes are ones that survive. Humans tend to build structures that cannot adapt and evolve, and we have these kinds of disasters. Life on Earth is subject to limits and boundaries. And as we stated before, that blue ball on the planet on the left is all the water on the planet, and the pink ball on the right is all the atmosphere. So we need, to, um, while these limits and boundaries act on a global scale, they play out at many smaller scales. Ecosystems are often defined by the limits to with which they are subjected, and we need to work within those limits and boundaries. And finally, life on Earth is subject to cyclical processes. And organisms on the planet use the predictability of these cycles to uh, survive. With the changes in climate, the cyclical processes are changing, and that is one reason why we're losing so many species. So in biomimicry, as we stated, it strives to emulate the general patterns and processes found in nature, and we refer to these as life's principles. So Diana is going to take us through the life's principles. All right. Well, thanks, Marie. Hello, everybody. Um, okay. Um, boy, this seems to um, hmm, this seems to be a, a slightly different PowerPoint than I um, was expecting, but that's all right. Um, so the life's principles. Um, as Marie has been um, introducing you, uh, life's principles are what, are what we as biomimics use to help us create more sustainable designs. We can also use life's principles to evaluate our designs. And, and by designs, 
that can be products, services, the way we organize our institutions, the way we design our buildings, the way we plan our communities. Um, and their life's principles are intended to represent nature strategies for sustainability based on how the biological organisms have sustained life on Earth for 3.85 uh, billion years. And, and life principles are also a tool to integrate nature's genius into our work. So there's 20, I was expecting a, um, I'm sorry, we, um, we're missing a slide here, that, um, Murray, maybe could you just um, go back for a minute to the LP slide? We, we have all of them together, would that be all right? Sure, sorry about that. We yeah, must have sorry. Missed, an air, missed a slide in there, so here we go. That's all right. Um, so here, are, there are 26 total. I'm going to talk about the six um, kind of main ones. And overall, we're looking at creating conditions conducive to life. But there are six, uh, six sort of main life principles that I'm going to go through today. And then during the person session, we'll go through all 26 in more detail. So uh, just to run through them, um, there's um, the resource efficient material and energy. We have use life-friendly chemistry, integrate development with growth, be locally attuned and responsive, adapt to changing conditions, and evolve to survive. So now um, maybe we could go to the first one, be resource efficient materials and energy. So apologize for that. So here's an example. This is actually from um, from my home, <laughs> um, where resource efficient material and energy means to skillfully and conservatively take advantage of resources and opportunities. And there are the sub strategies under underneath this one: um, using low energy processes, multifunctional design, recycling all materials, and fitting form to function. All are are other ways and part of the deep patterns we see in nature to be more resource efficient um, in terms of material and energy. So like if you, if you think about birds, um, birds, um, unlike other um, bony animals, they have hollow bones. And so birds have evolved to be really resource efficient by eliminating unnecessary material and only putting bone cells where it's needed. Um, the resulting structure is the most efficient use of materials but it still allows for the function of flight. So it's kind of it's interesting that flightless birds, such as the ostrich, the emu, and penguins, all have solid bones. And in this example, um, there's solar panels on the left. Um, in the middle, there's um, some Swiss chard, and on the right is a trom wall. And for those of you that are familiar with passive solar design, a trom wall is a massive heat sink made of rocks, concrete, or other materials that readily absorb the heat from the sun and then transmit it um, slowly into the surrounding, um, usually living space. And it's common to combine trauma walls with a small greenhouse. And so the Swiss chard, um, this picture was actually taken in the winter. And the outside temperature was about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, about 1, 2 degrees Celsius. And inside, the Swiss chard was very happy at, a 85, at 85 degrees. So this is um, a passive solar design augmented with um, PV panels. And it's an example of how human design systems, um, such as buildings, can follow life, the life's principle of being resource efficient, materials and energy, um, by taking advantage of the sun's free energy you know, and saving money and resources. All right, um, how about the next life's principle? The, the next life's principle is use life chemistry. And so here, life uses chemistry that supports life processes. And to bio, biochemistry, um, you know, a chemistry that occurs in living organisms, um, also uses some, the sub-strategies that uses are to break down products into benign constituents, build selectively with a small subset of elements. Uh, we as humans tend to want to use the whole periodic table, nature accomplishes amazing things using carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, just a small sub subset of the periodic table. And then also, um, life does chemistry in water. So we'll talk more about those in detail in person session. But 
and in the previous um, webinar, we talked about the blue muscle, how it makes an adhesive um, that the Columbia Forest products use that strategy and created Pure Bond. Um, when life does create um, toxins, uh, such as you know snake venom or botulin that causes botulism. Um, these toxins are produced selectively, they're produced locally, they're produced on demand, and they're produced only in the quantities needed. And this is essential because the, um, all, all of these materials are produced in or near the organism's own bodies, and you have to protect the chemist. So you wouldn't, the snake wouldn't want to produce the venom in a way, in such a way that it would harm itself. So it is very, Life, the chemistry is life friendly, and this and limitation um, that it has to be selective, locally on demand, and only in quantities needed helps ensure that when you look at it holistically, this chem the biochemistry is creating conditions conducive to life. And so, in, in this example here, that's the strategy that the um, milkweed, both the milkweed and the monarch use. Um, the milkweed plant contains terpenoids in a particular um, or form of terp, one of the terpenes called uh, cardiac glycoside. And this particular um, terpene is highly toxic to vertebrate herbivores, including humans. So in large doses, um, they can even cause heart attacks. Um, small doses, they can be thera thera um, therapeutic and can even help treat heart disease like digitalis comes from foxglove. But in this example, the milkweed plant, Asclepius, produces cardiac glycosides in its sap. So if you've ever broken off a leaf, milky sap, and it contains cardiac glycosides. And most animals will stay away from milkweed because of that. However, the milk, the monarch caterpillar, pictured on the left, has evolved in to tolerate the cardiac glycoside and safely eat milkweed. And so the Caterpillar stores these chemicals in its body, and then it's pretty amazing. But when the monarch caterpillar turns into the into a butterfly, it retains those toxins, and the monarch butterfly um, creates its own chemical defense. Because a bird who um, would eat a monarch would be poisoned by the glycosides inside um, contained in the monarch. So this is another example of how nature uses life-friendly chemistry in ways that support life. Right, what the next one? Okay, this is the life's principle, integrate development with growth. And here we talk about investing optimally in strategies that promote both development and growth. And some of the sub-strategies here are self-organize, build from the bottom up, and combine mo modular and nested components. And again, we'll talk more about these at the in-person session. So in, with growth, um, growth can provide new or better resources or an improved location or even increased quality for an organism. And it's necess growth is a necessity, but sustain a long life requires a balance between growth and development. And you can just think about the way our cities grow. Um, we can look at some that are more growing in a more sustainable manner where they support the growth with investment in infrastructure and transportation uh, versus those that don't and you end up with a lot more um, congestion on the highways. So let me see, and in this example, this is a glass sponge from, um, that's found from 10 to 1,000 meters um, below um, in the sea. And it's also called a Venus flower basket. And it invests resources in a structure as it grows. And they're, um, unlike other sponges, the Venus flower basket's body is created out of silica, which is abundant in the seawater. And as the sponge grows, there's a thinner cobweb of fibers that covers this lattice work. And the, the cobweb of fi fibers provides additional rigidity to the woven glass lattice work. And the body of the, this um, 
glass sponge is a thin-walled cylindrical tube with a large open center, and it's vase-shaped, which is where, why we call it a Venus flower basket. And the body is made up of these six pointed silica spicules, and they're joined together and as it grows, and it forms this network of rays and providing structural support for the sponge. So you can see this on the cross-section. So as the glass sponge grows, it makes itself stronger by creating this latticework cobweb, and that allows it to maintain its structure even at the deep pre or the high pressures that, um, that are found deep within the sea. And this is an example of um, how nature follows the life's principle of integrating development with growth. All right. Um, the next life principle is be locally attuned and responsive, um, fit in, and integrate with the surrounding environment. And so under this uh, main life principle heading, we have leverage cyclical processes, use readily available materials and energy, use feedback loops, and cultivate cooperative relationships. So the chances of survival increase as individuals become more adept at recognizing local conditions and locating and managing available resources. And the scale of local really depends on the organism or the system. Um, local to uh, bacteria is very different from local to a wolf or a large predator. But in order to survive, each strategy must be aligned with the local conditions. And organisms must have a means to both find the information and determine an appropriate response to that information. And so for organisms are able to learn from their environment, take that information in and learn or adapt to it, the feedback is pretty short. Other organisms, um, such as bacteria, um, in this example, which I'll go into in a second, um, other organisms, natural selection is the feedback loop, which is a much longer feedback loop. And over time, um, organisms evolve or, or go extinct if they don't evolve in a way that um, um, makes them more um, fit. So an example that um, you may have come across is the Namib beetle, um, which is able to, it's so locally attuned and responsive to its environment, it's able to harvest fog or harvest water from fog drifting in off the, um, off the coast of Namibia. And it does so by having a combination of hydrophilic and hydrophobic bumps on its back. And so it's super tuned um, to its environment. Another example would be, um, you know, sunglasses or eyeglasses that change in response to UV light. Um, some windows are also able to do this. And there's a chemical process that changes um, the lens molecules and darkens the glass in the presence of UV light and then lightens the glass in the absence. So you can um, walk in or out of a building um, and, and be locally attuned to the light conditions. So in this example, we um, have an, um, bacteria found in the geysers at Yellowstone National Park. This bacteria is called hydrogenobaculum bacteria. and Unlike most life on Earth, these bacteria can, ex can thrive in the extreme environmental conditions of these geysers. A pH of 3, maybe as high as 5.5, and really hot temperatures, 131 to 162 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 55 to 72 degrees Celsius. But these bacteria are really well adapted to this environment. Um, in fact, they thrive in this environment. And the hydrogenum vacuum uses hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon dioxide for, for energy. And these are all um, an abundant supply in the hot geyser waters. And, they, and if hydrogen sulfide isn't available, the bacteria can even use arsenic as an energy source. And so these are called extremophiles. And they're extremely well adapted to, um, very well adapted to these extreme conditions. And are able to fit in and integrate in, um, into um, these extremely acidic and hot environments. So they're um, certainly an example of being locally attuned and responsive to their local environment. All right, uh, next, please. Um, so the next life's principle is adapt to changing conditions, appropriately respond to dynamic contexts. So Marie talked about how um, 
one of the operating conditions of Earth is uh, dynamic non-equilibrium. So we're constantly um, um, offered the opportunity to adapt to changing conditions. And some of the sub-principles and strategies here are incorporate diversity, maintain integrity through self-renewal, and embody resilience through variation, redundancy, and decentralization. So creatures are constantly changing. They're trying to reach a steady, comfortable relationship with their environment, um, humans too. Uh, but in order to do so, an organism needs to be intimately aware of those ever-changing conditions. And some changes are significant enough to warrant a shift in behavior. And if an organism doesn't respond to those shifts, the individual will not survive. And if, if it occurs, if the conditions change on a large enough scale, entire species may go extinct. And this is some of the challenges we face now with climate change. So adaptation is a long-term alteration in strategy based on the degree of change in context. And so an example from the Arctic um, might be the hare or, um, or, or the Arctic hare or the fox or the ptarmigan, um, which are brown in the summer to blend in. And then as the local conditions change and it um, starts to patches of snow occur, they can become mottled and then eventually turn white in the winter to better blend in the snow conditions. So it's an example of being attuned to those local conditions. And then this you know, I don't know how many of you raft or kayak or canoe, but uh, you definitely have to be aware of the um, changing current and river conditions um, from, um, in order to alter your actions to best fit what's currently happening, what, what the water conditions are. And so, you know, pay attention. That's important advice when you're navigating a river and um, regard, regardless of what kind of um, vessel you're in. And the, you know, the river conditions can change quickly. So knowing how to read the water is key, looking for the Vs, knowing your strokes, um, looking for passages, and um, having techniques of how to eddy out. So, and having those tools with you so you can assess and then adapt to um, those changing conditions. Uh, and it, so it's an example of adapt to changing conditions as a life principle. And then finally, the last life principle is evolve to survive. Um, you know, we can look, I've given some human examples and some biological examples, but evolve to survive is sort of the grandmother or granddaddy of all of them in some ways. Um, continually incorporating and embodying information to ensure enduring performance. And the sub principles here are replicate strategies that work, integrate the unexpected, and reshuffle information, such as, you know, happens with DNA. So evolution is a change that spans across generations with traits that are passed on to the young. And you know, we've got gen uh, genetic evolution that um, occurs through mutations in the code of individuals or from the recombination of genes during sexual reproduction. And the process of natural selection sifts and um, kind of acts as a sieve to weed out the beneficial and detrimental mutations. So it favors those individuals that have the beneficial mutation. And the success of a species depends on the solution being embedded within the entire population, which would um, could re result in a true genetic shift. And so in this example, um, we use stakeholder input to achieve better results. And so this is a project I worked on um, here in Montana. Um, but it applies to whether you're designing a new product, a new survey, service delivery system, or playing, um, as in this example, to clean up a hazardous waste site. It's essential to involve the end users and others in, that have an interest in the project. So in this example, we sought stakeholder input early, often and always, and incorporated the information to make the cha make necessary change as early as we could in the project. And when it's easier, and that gives um, us more increased stakeholder buy-in and community buy-in and a better and more sustainable project. So in this particular example, before we decided to remove the Milltown Dam, EPA offered a proposed cleanup plan. We had lots of public meetings. We sought and received input. We reviewed public comments. We 
responded to them, we made some changes, and then we were able to um, come up with a cleanup plan, and we had about 98% 90 support of the cl eventual cleanup plan. So this is an example of involving stakeholders, incorporating their feedback, and um, and evolving to survive and create a long-term sustainable project. So um, ultimately creating results which are better suited and more sustainable in the long run. So that is a really quick run through of um, life's principles. And as I said, we'll go into all, we'll talk about all 26 of them when we get together in um, next month. All right? Okay, thanks Diana for that overview. So let's continue with our process of integrating biology into design. And really the final stage is evaluation. And evaluating is essentially ensuring that you've designed with nature in mind. It's a quality control check to ensure your design passes a sustainability test, as well as an audit to check for missed limits and opportunities. My work with EPA often re requires me to review existing design plans. And I use life's principles <clears throat> as an evaluation tool to indicate to the designer where their design may have problems in the future because it doesn't follow life's principles. Ideally, the measuring tools were specified in the scoping phase as life's principles, so they have a legitimacy and influence to return a project to the creating phase for the improvements if life's principles are not adequately mentioned or, or included. If the objective of the evaluation is more than just an inspection determining compliance with minimum quality and safety standards, any evaluation can enrich a project if there's an opportunity to revisit the design and incorporate these improvements. Similarly, audits are most effective if occurring before the final design is implemented and allows a chance to return to the design table and make improvements. Evaluating using biomimicry is an innovative way for humans to critique their project's appropriateness. Evaluations with nature as measure provides higher standards than conventional measuring tools since they are based on natural models which are functioning within their specific context as well as exemplifying life's principles. It would differ from current evaluation systems because life's standards incorporate more than just the project's performance, safety, and meeting quality goals. A biomimic Medic evaluation includes all those aspects plus the context. As we discussed in the scoping lecture, context with regard to sustainability means Earth's context. A truly successful design would recognize these operating conditions, characteristics of water, sunlight, and gravity, dynamic non-equilibrium, limits and boundaries, and cyclical processes. And so evaluating using biomimicry is an innovative way for humans to critique if their projects is appropriate. It also asks the question, if no other organism on the planet is doing something, should we as humans be doing it? So the set of life's principles is the primary metrics for judging the right or fitness of the design, asking a series of questions that look for the ecological feasibility of the proposed solution. Does the design fit in with the Earth's operating conditions? Does it draw on deep patterns and principles of the natural world? Will the design function like the other 30 million species that are alive today? The process of evaluation should follow the process you and your team are accustomed to, but need to consider the inclusion of some additional parameters or questions. The Biomimicry 3.8 has compiled these as a checklist, and it was included in your notes a few lectures back. This checklist is designed not as a yes-no kind of tool, but rather engages you to ask yourself each of the items. How well, if at all, does our design follow this principle? 
The set of life's principles is the primary metrics for judging the rightness of the design. And after 3.8 billion years of evolution, nature has learned what works, what is appropriate, and what lasts here on Earth. So using this checklist uh, gives you a better understanding of how well your project fits into that. So why integrate biology into design? If your design does not match a guideline well or at all, this needs to be addressed by reconsidering this guideline again in the creating phase. However, as you go through the evaluation process and find your design is not holding up against life's principles very well across the board, you may need to revisit the scoping phase. Perhaps your function and context were not clearly or properly defined. Or perhaps you did not act accurately distill the deep design principles from the creating phase. By scrutinizing your design in this way, you are essentially pre-testing it for success in the big picture and in the long run. You may discover that your emulation of nature was actually very shallow. The case study for the Great Sand Dunes Hydration Challenge is an example of a shallow emulation as the team did this project during an on-site workshop without the benefit of researching the biological strategy. The solution we found was a good start to designing a better system, but the solution does not meet all of life's principles. It's tempting and rather easy to crudely mimic the shape or pattern in nature, ignoring function and context. And be wary of this tendency. Abstracting and emulating an abstracted design principle moves the design process away from the slavish copying of nature which is a frequent point of criticism from some biomimicry objectors. An alternative approach to the checklist is to build a matrix of life's principles against each of the functions of your design. By systematically filling out the entire matrix for how each aspect of the design follows each of life's principles, you can easily identify areas of weakness and strength to address these as appropriate. This type of evaluation takes a significant amount of time, but it does ensure that your evaluation is objective and thorough. If the success of your project has high stakes, it's worth taking the time to undergo this process. In my BPRO educational setting, I developed a matrix for a project with the Cuyahoga River Valley project, which I'll share with you during the in-person session to show you how we used a matrix to evaluate using life's principles. When life's principles are used as a measurement tool, each individual principle is assessed for each aspect of the project, recognizing that many of the values would depend on the specifics of the project and the project location. In this way, the evaluation can pretest for real-world success that functions well in the context of the world. Life principles, when used in a matrix of interconnected systems and principles, as noted earlier, is extremely useful in identifying missed limits and opportunities. Should you find a missing or weakly expressed element, you have identified where there is a potential to better leverage a limit as an opportunity. So let's look at how we use life's principles to evaluate the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Projects project. So in the project to discover a new approach to road and trail surfacing at Boulder's Open Space and Mountain Parks, we use life's principles as aspirational goals throughout the project. In the request for proposals, we selected key life principles that will be used to evaluate the proposed design solution. Instead of the whole list, Open Space and Mountain Parks has selected the ones that are most important to them, such as using life's friendly chemistry. So they decided that there was no asphalt or concrete would be allowed as a road surface. We want to use readily available materials and energy. So a list of materials that had been stockpiled after a recent flood event will be provided to the contractors and they are encouraged to make use of these local materials. We wanted to incorporate diversity. 
so. We found that the trail does not need to be a monolith of one kind of surface, but integrating diverse surface types would add to the aesthetics and ease of maintenance. And we also wanted to combine modular and nested components to create a trail surface from components that could be easily repaired or replaced is an extra. So that's how we used life's principles in this particular example. Lastly and significantly, the evaluation phase encourages us to also ask, what wouldn't nature do? The answer to this question can provide incredible foresight in anticipating where limits have been inappropriately exceeded or strategies are likely to fail under one parameter or another. As I stated earlier, EPA usually gets final design ideas to evaluate. Using life's principles as the evaluation provo approach provides the designer with a heads up on where their design may fail in the future. Imagine for a moment what our world would look like today if many of our current unsustainable designs were forced to undergo the question of what nature wouldn't do prior to being set onto the world. Now imagine if every design from here forward was able to confidently perform and reach each of nature's guidelines. A world empowered by life's principal design genius sounds pretty good to me. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what is a system because as we stated earlier and Diana compounded on that idea that life's principles are a set of collective ideas, not singling them out. So what is a system? The Earth is a huge system. Countries are systems, cities are systems, and neighborhoods are systems. Neighborhoods are also components within the larger system of the city. A system is a group of independent but interrelated elements comprising a unified whole. In order to change the way a system is working and flowing, you must first define and understand the parts of the system. You define the system, naming the centerpiece, and determining the elements or key pieces affect or, or are affected by other pieces in the system. The system include as much or little as you like, but realize the more detailed your system understanding becomes by finding all of the elements, ties, interconnectedness, and relationships, the more you can see the whole picture and increasing your chances of being able to effectively adjust the system variables. Systems can be very complicated, they can be layered, and things are usually part of numerous systems. Likewise, due to the complexity, there are lots of places to intervene and create both intended and sometimes unintended consequences. So what role do life's principles play in changing a system? Each principle applied and fully adopted likely requires a shift in the current overall purpose and goals of the design. As you might imagine, combining all of life's principles together, the adoption of life's principles represents a complete paradigm shift. By changing what is held valuable and to what we hold our decisions accountable, using frameworks like full cost accounting and triple bottom line, this mindset change does not have to be limiting. Instead, it widens the path for creation of new solutions that were previously thought unacceptable or impossible. Well, now let's look and see how a system works. If humans succeed in reaching the goal of living within life's principles, we will increase our chance of surviving on Earth. For many biomimics and also those people having just been introduced to biomimicry, the underlying attraction to biomimicry is not just the opportunity for new novel solutions, but the underlying current of hope and the idea of being proactive, taking a step towards the goal of fitting in on Earth believing in the importance and necessity of living within the Earth's operating conditions and following life's principles represents a change in our basic assumptions in many ways, a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is a complete change in core values and belief systems that facilitates a new condition. In this case, the new condition is sustainable living on our planet. 
under new conditions, our current unsustainable living and designing habits would be deemed unacceptable. It takes persistence and it requires the right placement and the right timing, but this mindset shift is not an impossible change. Just think, 80 years ago, all of our agriculture was organic. In order to alter Homo sapiens' effect on the earth, people need to behave differently. In order to change people's behavior, people must first change their thinking. A different mindset is needed. With new values and attitudes, people will act differently. They will make decisions in alignment with their new values. And a paradigm shift is about changing attitude, changing mindset, and changing people's basic assumptions. The renowned systems thinker Donella Meadows' essay, Places to Intervene in the System, lists and explains the importance and effectiveness of the multiple leverage points in a system. We've included a link to this article in your homework, and it's worth a read. As you do, think about the system you operate in and where the important places you can intervene, where your leverage points are. Diana, you want to talk about leverage points? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so we um, have included this reading. It's pretty, it's pretty short. Um, maybe a dozen pages or so, and um, I'd encourage you to, to read it. If you, um, and I've just summarized the leverage points here um, from number 12 being the least, um, offering us the least leverage. Um, you know, and as at EPA, we spend a lot of time um, talking about the numbers and the standards. And, um, and if you notice, uh, you know, what is the allowable standard for arsenic in drinking water, for instance, and you as you notice, that's number 12. So that's our least leverage. Um, as you work the way, your way up towards number one, um, certainly the most powerful is the power to transcend the paradigm. Um, and as Marie has been talking about, we need a paradigm shift or a change in mindset to, to really have um, the most leverage. So if you have a few minutes and can read that article, I think, I think you'll find it really eye-opening and quite interesting. Great. And in the in-person session, we will have an exercise where we will work with each team to identify where you have leverage to bring your new idea and solution into flourishing. So let me just review the August homework. We'd like to you to continue working on your challenge, research nature, and abstract strategies. We want you, this is very important for each team to develop a summary of your work to date. It's critical that these summaries are completed and sent to Diana and I by August 4th. The in-person session logistics, we want you to complete the registration form and send it to Sheridan by July 31st. Um, if you are unable to attend the in-person session, but you would like to receive your copy of the Biomimicry Resource Guide, there's a place on the form to fill out just your name and address and send that to Sheridan, and we will mail you the um, resource guidebook that accompanies this uh, workshop. We also have included another eyesight. Um, a link to an optional radio show that was uh, recorded in 2011 uh, as part of the Bioneers Conference, and it gives you an, some more examples of integrating biomimicry into design. And we read the article, Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in the System by Don Allen Meadows. So once we receive the critical summaries of where you are in your uh, team's effort to complete your environmental challenge, we will sit down with the in-person experts, um, Karen Allen, Jamie Dwyer, uh, Diana Hammer, and myself. We'll brainstorm additional resources that we can bring to your team. So we hope that at least one member of each team will be at attending the in-person session. Uh, so get those registration forms in. On the registration forms, there's also an, a place where you can indicate if you are driving and you have room in your car, uh, or if you want to carpool with someone else. So we'll work to link up those individuals who live nearby so we can do some carpool. 
Um, in order to facilitate uh, better working for each team, Diana and Marie are available to answer your questions during these two optional phone meetings. Um, it has a call-in number and access code. These will be conference lines that Diana and I will be on at 9 to 10 Mountain Standard Time on July 22nd and 29th. Uh, this information is included on your homework sheet. And please use this opportunity to receive one-on-one -on -one assistance from these biomimicry experts. A review of the in-person session. Uh, again, this is a log home near Bozeman Pass in the Bangtail Mountains. It's at 6,000 feet altitude, has aspen trees, tall native grasses, a pine forest, there's an outdoor hot tub, um, and a, a creek nearby. Uh, there's a kitchen there. We'll be collecting a fee of $100 per person, and we will bring the food to the, per, to the session uh, with assignments for dinner and cleanup crews for each meal. So uh, we have a lot of sleeping options. Uh, we'll be sharing bedrooms. Uh, there's three beds in this teepee outside, and you could also bring your camping equipment if you're interested in just camping out. We ask you to arrive at 2 p.m. on August 9th uh, and before 5 o'clock for check-in. Uh, we'll, we, we're going to uh, have the closeout and leave by 11 o'clock a.m. on the 13th of August after the closing circle. And again, we'll try to coordinate rides to and from the airport and for um, carpool rides. The final case study reports, um, we're hoping that each team will develop a real draft of your final report during the in-person session with the help of the biomimicry experts. They'll be due to Diana and I by September 11th, 2015. And Peaks to Prairie has graciously um, decided that they will uh, sponsor one final report webinar, and it's scheduled for September 16th at the same time in the same uh, manner, so that each team could go over their final report and present it to the class. So I'll leave it open for some questions. Uh, just remember to submit your reservation form for the in-person session with these biomimicry experts, including Diana and myself. So does anyone have any questions concerning any of the material that was covered today? You can raise your hand. I'm wondering if um, we could get a show of hands of who is planning to, of those who are on the um, call, who is planning to attend the in-person? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm planning on coming. Kendra's coming. Okay, great. Kate, not coming. Darn it. Peter's coming. Great. Nina, Dane is. Pat and Ted, all right. And Kendra's driving from the Boulder, Denver area. I know that there's some people in the Boulder, Denver area that would like a ride, so we'll try to link you up with all those. Jane will fly in. OK. That sounds great. Well, um, I just wanted to, re to um, do one more pitch. These two women here, uh, Jamie Dwyer and Karen Allen, they graduated with me in the biomimicry professional track in 2010. And they've been practicing biomimics since that time. Um, the biomimicry group has, um, has sponsored a workshop just the week before our in-person session. And the cost to attend that workshop with these two experts is $4,000 plus your travel costs. So you're getting a real bargain, uh, able to come to this workshop with the same experts uh, just for the $100 fee of food. So hopefully everybody will be able to attend or will be able to bring back that information to your teams. Um, any other questions or comments before we end? Okay, well, that's it for this webinar, and we will see you all in August. 
Uh, please remember those two phone dates if you need questions, or you can call either Diana or I at any time if you want a one-on-one -on -one consult on your. Don't forget to engage Sheridan in helping you with researching your functions. And that's it for today. We'll sign off. Bye. Thanks, everybody.